thanks for joining us today on a webinar sponsored by the American Friends of Yad Sara. The name of our webinar is Snapshots of Society on the Ground Observations of Israel's Coronavirus Experience. My name is Perry Rosenfeld and I'm a proud board member of the American Friends of Yad Sara. And I'm also in my day job, the director of the Center for Innovations in the Advancement of Care in NYU Langone Medical Center in New York City. I will be moderating what I believe to be a very stimulating and informative session. For those of you who are first learning about Yad Sara, let me tell you a few things about this incredible organization. Yad Sara offers a wide variety of solutions to meet the needs of Israeli society, from elder care, home care, medical equipment loans, and advocating for disability rights, just to name a few of their great services. Yad Sara serves all Israelis, Jews and Muslims, and all communities, whether they are in the Green Line or beyond. And using a very innovative volunteer model, Yad Sara can provide these services free of charge or at a minimal cost. I'm a medical sociologist and I do research on health services. And I'm looking forward to hearing about how our colleagues in Israel are meeting the challenge of COVID-19 in their individual communities. As you know, each community has their own unique qualities and cultures that should be considered when successfully providing effective care. So first, before we ask our questions, let me introduce our panelists. First, Jonathan Fersinger, Fersinger, sorry, is an award-winning American journalist based in Jerusalem. He has a long and varied resume reporting on Israeli and Palestinian affairs, as well as serving as Asia Regional Editor for UPI in Hong Kong. He is currently working on a book about Israel's warming relations with the Gulf region countries. And next is Rebecca Palmer, who made Aliyah from London with her parents when she was just 16 and has been the, at the branch in Beit Shemesh since 2000. She is currently the branch manager, the branch manager. When she started, volunteers had used, were using handwritten notes to keep track of their, their clients. Now she computerized the branch and she extended this network and expanded resources in their area. That's a great achievement. And finally, Michael Benson is a retired educator who currently serves as the branch manager of the Be'er Sheva um, Yad Sara. He brings 44 years of experience as a principal and a teacher in Be'er Sheva to his work in Yad Sara. Like Rebecca, he too was born in London and he had made Aliyah in 1963. Welcome to all of you. I'm delighted to have you join me for this dynamic discussion. I'd like to uh, start with my first question to Jonathan. As a journalist, I'd like for you to uh, tell us a little bit about what you see um, as Israel's early successes in COVID um, treatment and prevention. Um, what, can, what did we learn from Israel in those early days? So thank you, Perry. It's really a pleasure to, uh, to be with you and with Michael and Rebecca. Um, so I got uh, caught in the, uh, the middle of the uh, transition. I was in New York uh, and I was uh, working in the Upper West Side at Columbia. Uh, and suddenly uh, my program got shut down. Um, and uh, it was clear, uh, or my wife said it was clear that I ought to be uh, back home in, in Jerusalem. Um, I found that uh, a, a flight that I had on Virgin Airlines was was canceled, um, and so I rescheduled for uh, Ukrainian International uh, Airlines, and I made the dash home. So just paint the contrast. In early March, you know, we knew that this was going on in, in China and in Italy, and it was horrifying. And then while I was in New York, um, it struck in New Rochelle. Uh, I was in Riverdale, 
And it, it suddenly, I, what happened? I, uh, I was disinvited from lunches. Um, it, you know, people, SAR, the, the school over there, there were, were quarantines. And uh, anyway, it was, I, I experienced a little bit of it in New York, um, but it was still, it still seemed far away. Then I went through Kiev and flew into uh, Ben Gurion Airport. And man, it was uh, clear that uh, I was in a country that was preparing for this, that took this very seriously. Um, so the first thing after I got off the plane was I was rounding down to the, uh, the, customs, the customs area and there was a woman from Magen David, uh, Adam, the red Magen David, uh, with a big sign that said, you know, welcome to Israel, here are the regulations for uh, coronavirus. And she sort of beckoned me and I walked over and then she held back, she said, just wait there. Um, and she said, okay, you're here, you need to learn about social distancing, you need to learn about masks, you need to learn about gloves, and um, just, you know, come home, welcome home, but be safe. Uh, anyway, then I went outside the airport, my wife picked me up in the car, she said, you go in the back seat, um, <laughs> in the front, uh, there was plastic on the seats, the windows were open, and we went to Jerusalem, and I was in quarantine for two weeks. So right. that right. was the lockdown that we know about. Uh, and it was very um, deliberate, uh, the, the government, and with um, you know, Bibi Netanyahu at uh, the top, um, said they were going to be tough on everybody. And uh, we were not allowed to uh, go beyond 100 yards from the, uh, from the house. Uh, that mm -hmm. lasted for a couple of weeks. It was eventually extended. Um, but, you know, as everybody in the U.S. and everybody in the world and the U.K. and, uh, you know, the, everybody knows the drill. Um, so, you know, this was the new normal. Um, yeah. we, we dealt with it. And, uh, and then they started opening things up again. Uh, and now we're dealing with the, like uh, with that. Yeah, I'd like give your colleagues a little time to uh, supplement that very interesting story about your return um, and being in New York at that time and it was uh, quite terrifying. <laughs> so, um, I'll go to you for returning home. But uh, Rebecca and uh, Michael, do either of you have any uh, early uh, uh, thoughts about the early days of the COVID and the successful strategies that were used in your communities to uh, to address uh, the pandemic? Um, I, just, I just first. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, as far as we were concerned, I found that um, my older volunteers were gradually dropping out. They were, they were scared to leave the house. I mean, we were told, don't leave the house. If you're over 70, consider yourself uh, uh, at risk group. And the older volunteers um, were gradually dropping out. Um, I'm lucky that I have an, a large enough number of younger volunteers, particularly high school children, um, kids. Um, and that was the, the coin. The high school kids weren't going to school, so they were able to come and, and do extra shifts for me. I had um, students or um, volunteers who had volunteered when they were in, since finished high school and gone off, say, to um, Hesde Yeshivas, and they were also sent home. I had a short Lumi girl who was sent home. And therefore, they had time on their hands. They were able to help continue running the branch while the older volunteers stayed at home. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and, uh, that was more or less what happened in Belsheva. I think what happened in the beginning was people were really scared and took everything very, very seriously. Uh, um, today, the, the situation is different. We'll probably talk about that. Um, and, and in fact, um, um, the, the, the activity in the branch in Beersheba was cut down a great deal, mostly because we didn't have any volunteers, because most of my volunteers, uh, as Rebecca said, most of the volunteers are, are um, old age pensioners and were afraid to leave their homes. But uh, we also had a wonderful group of students and a wonderful group of, of, uh, of school children from, uh, from the 12th grade and more. And they all volunteered and they were terrific. And, and actually, thanks to them, 
we managed to get and we managed to continue uh, continue working the branch. And this is very important because uh, um, uh, one of the things I want to uh, stress is that um, the branch in Be'er Sheva is very, very big. We've got 480 volunteers and we're actually serving not only Be'er Sheva, but all the area around Be'er Sheva. And very often the smaller branches around Be'er Sheva also can't really... Uh, Yerucham always opens, that I know, but other, bran <laughs> but other branches don't always open and people have to come to Be'er Sheva if they have important needs. So it's very, very important that the branch should keep working. And, and actually all these new volunteers it did really help us, but it was also a problem. The other problem was, I think we didn't really understand um, what we can do, and we'll talk about that maybe later, what we can do in order to protect the volunteers. And as soon as we learned what we can do to protect them, then that allowed a lot of the volunteers who were, uh, were a bit worried, allowed them to come back and th that, that helped them there. And most of them are still with us now. I think this is a great opportunity to talk about. How did you protect them? Did they go to people's homes or was it just okay. working uh, no, in the... No. Well, yeah, okay. Well, well we, did, we did two things. First of all, it's very important to protect the volunteers who, who are actually working in the building, who are giving out equipment to people. So uh, we have a very strict rule. We had somebody sitting at the entrance and uh, not allowing people to come in without masks and also uh, taking the temperature of everybody who came in. Um, we, we put signs on the floor so that when people are standing in a queue, they'll, they'll keep a distance from each other. And we were very strict about this. Um, it, it wasn't very easy because there were people who were coming without masks and got very upset when we said we're not going to let them in. Uh, um, but well, that, that was what we did. Then, of course, all the volunteers were given masks and were given gloves uh, um, and, and given soap and everything. And in addition, uh, we also put up these kind of plastic screens uh, before, the, before the volunteers who are working on the computers and, and taking down all the, the, the personal data because uh, that was very important. And of course, everybody, uh, everybody who brought equipment back from the home, then this equipment had to be uh, dealt with because, before we could even touch it. Uh, and we had somebody special doing this and we still do have. And all this kind of thing um, made people feel a lot more comfortable and so they, 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 the, a lot of the volunteers started to come, in, come back. I, I must add, though, that uh, in this, the latest outbreak here, some of them have got scared again and have decided not to come. But, uh, but at least it, di it did encourage a lot of people to come. And also what, uh, what Yad Sarah did was also to extend a service which we have usually, but this time we extended it and made it much cheaper. And that is people could call from home and order equipment and we take the equipment to them to their home instead of them coming and this we did a lot not only in Be'er Sheva but also outside Be'er Sheva we had to deliver a lot of equipment which prevented a lot of people from making unnecessary journeys and, and that made everybody feel a bit safer I think. That's great and uh, Rebecca did you have similar experiences in uh, Beit Shemesh? Similar we're a much smaller branch um, but for the first two months when we had much more of a stricter lockdown, we weren't receiving equipment back. We made it quite clear people could come and take equipment, but we weren't receiving equipment back. Once we did start receiving equipment back, we had special um, um, sprays to, to clean the equipment, to desanitize and uh, or sanitize um, the equipment. The, 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 the volunteers who deal with the equipment um, were prepare the equipment and you know and clean it properly before we were able to re um, lend it out again um, mm -hmm. as I said we have a smaller branch so in our case what we did was we basically put two chairs across the entrance to the branch and we let people come in one at a time and again they had to be wearing a mask the volunteers were wearing a mask um, mm -hmm. and therefore as Michal said it, gradually the volunteers started coming back just this week as things have got really bad again two volunteers have said I'm not going to come in for a while, but most of them are still coming in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, we've already heard that, you know, the, a couple of comments about things didn't stay as good as they were and uh, starting to have additional concerns about a second lockdown. So, Jonathan, what do you think, um, what are some of the issues you think that have brought this about? Well, this change? You know, it, it's kind of extraordinary from a political vo point of view. Uh, you know, during this period of uh, COVID, uh, 
presenting a, a terrible threat, and and everybody recognized, uh, you know, more and more uh, how important it was to to stay inside and distance. Um, but we also had this political crisis, and there were, uh, you know, there had been the elections uh, in early March, and in the, uh, the the first month was when uh, the Likud and Blue and White were trying to put together a government. The government that finally constituted itself was supposed to be the coronavirus government, right? That the front and center, everything was about. Um, how to deal with the pandemic. Um, and uh, over time, we've seen that that was the last thing that they were really interested in dealing with. Uh, and it's turned into uh, a, a tug of war between parties. Yes, they're um, coming up with regulations and then they're uh, vetoed by uh, one committee or the, uh, you know, the health minister. Um, and uh, now I think that there's a, uh, you know, a, a lack of faith, a, a loss of trust in the government um, right now. And people are uh, you know, looking at this uh, new outbreak, you know, the second wave, if that's what we're calling it, and saying, my gosh, how are we going to, number one, get people to wear masks again and uh, to uh, you know, take the precautions, uh, and you know, we were talking about weddings. Uh, you know, suddenly people were uh, feeling comfortable in large gatherings, and the government said, uh, "Fine." Um, and now I, I think there was a poll that said seventy-five percent of Israelis are, are really you know disappointed and angry about this, and there are street demonstrations. So, politically, I you know, as a journalist. My gosh, this is uh, you know this is uh, gold. But for the society, it's a it's a rough it's a rough time. Yeah. So so Rebecca, what kinds of uh, um, circumstances? What kind of uh, things did you observe that people were doing? Um, at, you know, when things got better, what kinds of things were people doing that resulted in this potential lockdown? I, I assume the lockdown has not been um, you know de declared yet, right? No, we're not in lockdown. They're gradually bringing back certain restrictions. Um, one of the things was that they basically lifted the lockdown and they lifted the restrictions too quickly. They needed the schools, at least the junior schools and the kindergartens to go back so people could go to work. But like we talked about weddings, they suddenly allowed 250 people at a wedding. They opened up the beaches, the, the gyms, the restaurants, nightclubs. Um, things that maybe they should have waited a while with that. And because we did have four or five weeks where the numbers were very low, people became blasé. People are less strict about wearing their masks. And also it's been a long time. People are finding it difficult to keep wearing a mask all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think I the other, I'm sorry, I think the other problem is that, uh, that there really is a very great economic problem here. People don't have any money. Uh, people don't go to work, and particularly uh, people who are, uh, who are running all these businesses that we're talking about now, uh, they've got a very, very serious problem. All their life's work is disappearing in front of them. Uh, and they, they were putting on a lot of pressure on the government uh, uh, to allow them to, to, open up, uh, to open up again. Uh, and I, and I, can, I can understand that. But uh, of course, that was one of the, one, it, it, was a, it was a problem to find the golden mean between uh, mm -hmm. allowing these people to, to, to make a living again uh, and doing it in such a way that people wouldn't, uh, wouldn't uh, infect one uh, each other. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't really succeed in that, I think, <laughs> to be honest. Well, what are you planning for your uh, respective branches going forward? Are you making any specific um, plans or for the next few weeks for the current situation and to address the concerns that people have now? Well, well, I, I hope that we can that we can keep uh, as far as Belshev is concerned. I hope we can keep the current level of activity that we have. I, um, I hope that uh, that uh, the the volunteers won't be too scared and will st will still come, and we'll be able to give give the service that we can. I, um, what, what we have added on is something uh, uh, something else is that uh, on the front door there are two telephone numbers. One of them mine. <laughs> <laughs> there are two telephone numbers, and if people come when the branch is shut and they have something very serious and very urgent, then, then they do call, call either me or another volunteer, 
and somebody uh, uh, goes to the building, opens the building, and helps them. Um, and I hope we can keep doing that. One of the uh, one of the unfortunate results of all this, of course, is that um, we have a rehabilitation center, which they don't have in, in Bechemish. We have a rehabilitation center, which is closed, and it, we don't know when it's going to be opened again. And of course, this is really very, very serious for these people who, who this is the only way they can get out of the home sometimes and meet somebody else and have some kind of activity. And of course, when they, they come to our really rehabilitation center, uh, um, uh, this gives a great a lot of rest to the family because the family are looking after people. And we're talking about people who are really very, very, uh, very, very sick and, and, and crippled and very limited in their movement. Um, and there's nothing we can really do about it. And, and this really is disturbing me quite personally, but disturbing me, disturbing the director of the rehabilitation center. But this is something, a problem that we probably can't solve because these are people who, who are really are in a dangerous situation and we can't bring them all together. Um, but apart from that, we, we've managed to, uh, to renew all the other services and everything is running uh, uh, quite well, I think. Mm -hmm. Good. So uh, Rebecca, uh, in terms of Beit Shemesh, uh, um, do you feel that for the next, uh, the next phase? Um, I hope so. In the way that we carried on, we, we managed to keep the branch open throughout the first wave. Um, hopefully we'll do the same thing the second, uh, you know, if we have to the second time round. If the, mm -hmm. some volunteers choose not to come in, the, you know, hopefully the younger ones will, will give us a backup. Um, we did find in the first wave that there were people who needed equipment who weren't necessarily sick with COVID, but they needed equipment at home, but they were housebound, either because they were sick with something else or they were elderly and they, they really didn't want to leave the house. And we, I did have um, various volunteers that went, took um, things to the house, you know, they delivered to the houses. Um, one particular story, my son was, was running a shift and um, a woman called in and said, I don't live in Bet Shemesh, but my children live in Bet Shemesh. They've just had a baby. We had a Brit last week and someone at the Brit has, is now has COVID. So they're in quarantine, but they need a crib. So he said, no problem. He took their details. He took everything over the phone and they went and delivered the crib to them. They left it outside the front door and said to them, you know, like we've left it there. We've gone up in the front door. Um, <laughs> That, that was because this poor couple, new parents, couldn't get out of the house. Mm -hmm. And we had similar yeah. stories with elderly people. Uh, yeah, well, go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah. If I could just uh, tell a story about uh, an elderly person that I'm, I'm very close to. And uh, just about an hour and a half ago, um, I was over uh, at uh, the apartment. This is um, a, a fellow who's 90 years old and is uh, extremely ill, uh, transferred after five weeks um, from Shari Tzedek Hospital to, uh, to his house. Uh, and uh, Yad Sara, um, brought a, a full hospital bed and equipment to kit them out, to set them up over there. The volunteers were so uh, professional and, um, and caring uh, and careful about uh, COVID. And I, I just left him and it, it's extraordinary. It's you know, in uh, his bedroom, but it's, uh, you know, it's kitted out like a, uh, a medical facility. So I was very impressed with that. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I understand Rebecca that you had a, a story of a somewhat similar circumstances with an elderly uh, client. Can you tell us about that story, about Gisela? Uh, this was different. This was, if you're talking about Gisela, Gisela runs the branch in the Ain Karim Hospital in Jerusalem, and um, their branch was basically closed down by the hospital. The hospital wouldn't allow the volunteers to come in. This was, we're talking about in April time. Um, and Gisela's been running that branch for a long time. She suddenly was at home with nothing to do, and she was looking, you know, how to keep herself occupied. And she basically turned around to Yadzer and said, let's open a branch in my garden. She lives in the Rehavia area. And she emptied out her garden shed and cleaned it out. And Yad Sarab bought shelves, put up shelves and bought her equipment and um, put the Yad Sarab computer program on her computer. And she now has a Yad Sarab branch. Uh, she has a separate entrance that can, goes directly to the garden. They don't have to come via her house. Um, well, that shows great ingenuity right. and uh, 
Um, do you get a sense that she's very busy with, uh, with her new branch? I think so. I think so. And she's happy that she has the branch there. When it's in your own home, you don't necessarily have set hours, so people can come whenever's convenient, um, as long as they make a phone, you know, make an appointment for beforehand. Um, these kind of branches in people's homes, are, you know, are, it's not unusual. There are several branches like that in people's homes um, around the country. Mm -hmm. that, I did not know that. That's fascinating that they're in people's homes. And um, Michael, did you have any particular interesting stories of uh, services or individuals that you served uh, in recent weeks during the pandemic? Yeah, well, one of the things that we, we discovered right at the beginning was, and it, it got quite a lot of publicity as well, was that there are lots of people at, at home uh, who don't have anybody to talk to. Um, they either don't have any family or their family lives a long way away uh, um, and, and they're really on their own. Um, and so what we did in Yad Sarain Belsheva was we decided that we'd, we'd start uh, looking for these people. So we did have a, quite a long list of people that had been to Be'er Sheba and we, uh, to Be'er Sheba Yad Sarah, and we knew who they were, uh, and we, co we collected more. And, and, and in the end, we, we, also, um, we also utilized the services of uh, volunteers, our volunteers, who said they, they, were, they couldn't really come to Yad Sarah because they were afraid. So, and we set up this center for, for calling um, uh, lonely people. And we've got about 500 people on this list of uh, this that we're calling. Um, people call them about once a week, sometimes twice a week. It was amazing the the the, uh, the reactions that we got. People were so amazed that somebody actually called them on the telephone to ask if they were okay and if they needed anything. Uh, um, some of them they were really very emotional. Some of them were very worried and actually called Yad Sarah in order to, to ask if really it was Yad Sarah who called them. One, one of the, the side uh, uh, results of this was, of course, that we very often, uh, not too often I'm pleased to say, but we did um, discover people who had serious problems. There were people who said, everything's okay, but I don't have any food. Or everything's okay, but the, I don't know, the, the air conditioner isn't working. Uh, everything's okay, but my telephone is broken. All sorts of, the, the, all sorts of problems and of course, because we've got lots of volunteers and lots of connections and lots of connections in the municipality, very often we can actually help these people to solve these problems that have been sitting with at home for ages. And if they hadn't called, then they'd be, remain with this problem. I don't know who would have helped them. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that was very, that, I think that's very, that, was very, that was very important. And we're continuing with that now because people aren't, uh, aren't going out anymore. Um, and so we continue to calling them. One of the things I, I want to add that Yad Sarah uh, did, and that's certainly concerned with the, these people, is that Yad Sarah came to an agreement with the Ministry of Welfare, and we're now uh, uh, putting in 20,000 personal alarms in people's homes. Now, all the, who are these 20,000 people who are getting this personal alarm? These are 20,000 people whom the welfare departments, the municipality welfare departments, are recommending. In Beersheba, we've, we've got about 150 or 200 like this, and I know, what, I know who they are because we've been going to their homes and putting in this personal alarm. And this is very, very important. It saves life. There were, unfortunately, a, a, several incidents of people who, who fell at home, and by the time they were discovered, it was too late. And, and this per, these 20,000 personal alarms are going to maybe save lives of 20,000 people or make their lives make their lives more, more, more safe. Uh, and this is also something very, very important that we've been doing. As I said, we've been doing this in Beersheba, but this is not only in Beersheba, but uh, 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 here we've also been doing this. And also, this is also, we go into somebody's house to give them a personal alarm, and the volunteers know when you go into a house, have a look and see if there's something else that we can do. Yes, uh, sometimes they ask a person, do you have any food? And they say, well, look, have a look. And they open the refrigerator and you see that they hardly got anything. So, you know, they have a problem. They're embarrassed to say. But they also see, and, and, and so, there's a, again, we can help them with other things. And this, this personal contact with these people who need personal contact, I think, is one of the wonderful things that we've been doing. 
Yes, excellent. And uh, I presume that some some of these practices are shared with the other Yatsara branches. Your success stories, Rebecca. Have you uh, you know had some success stories that you can share with others? Um, we're a much smaller branch than Bear. For example, are you also? I'm losing connection me, with you. Go ahead. Now I was losing connection with you. Um, we we don't do home visits in Bet in Bet Shemesh, um, and we have been lending out more of the personal alarm systems, not necess necessarily through the welfare system, but I think because people are stuck at home, they show more people are showing interest and in coming in uh, to ask about the alarm systems, um, and. Normally, I um, I visit the day centres. There are various uh, day centres for the for seniors around Bet Shemesh and the surrounding areas, and I often do visit them. I'm in contact with the physiotherapist there if people need equipment. But a lot of these centres were closed, or even if they've reopened now, not all of the people are coming back. They're worried to leave, and various people have phoned or spoken to me and said they need equipment. They need something but they're not going out and therefore we've made home visits um, specifically to help these people because normally they're given the, the supporting framework within the day center. Yes, I just got a question that I'd like to introduce now because I think it's relevant is um, someone wrote, uh, Sari wrote, I'm wondering if you offer your wonderful services to minority communities, such as the Ethiopians. Could you discuss that, uh, Michael, and maybe you oh, have- yes. uh, yeah. Oh, yes, of course. We, anybody who comes in, first of all, anybody who comes in, doesn't matter who he is, and needs the help of Yad Sarah, will get the help of Yad Sarah. Um, in Beersheba in particular, I said, I said earlier that we serve not only Be'er Sheva itself, but also the surrounding community. The surrounding community, of course, is a, has a very, big, a very big Bedouin community. Just the biggest Bedouin city is not far away from Be'er Sheva, Rahat. There are 70,000 inhabitants. And of course, they come to Be'er Sheva a great deal. We also have volunteers. Incidentally, we have volunteers. Not enough, but we do have some volunteers from Rahat as well. And um, so we certainly, we certainly serve them and they, they need, they, whenever they need, whatever they need, they come and, and, and they get. Jonathan talked about hospital beds before, and very often they need hospital beds as well. Um, and we're not talking only about Bedouin who live in, in the Bedouin uh, cities, but there are, are Bedouin who still live in encampments out in the middle of the desert, and, and they come and, and take equipment. They, when they bring the equipment back, it's very obvious that it's been in the middle of a desert, but well, that's a, that's a, a, a price we have to pay. As for the, 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 the um, population of Be'er Sheba itself, um, it's, called, it's also very, very, there's a very big Russian population. There's a very big Ethiopian population. Um, and, and of course, we, we, we serve them. We serve them all, everybody who comes gets our help and of course some of them need a lot of explanation about what they're doing some of them don't really know what they can how we can help them and this is this is a big problem um, particularly particularly with the ethiopians and we're making great efforts in order to try to um, to explain to them and um, also with the bedouins uh, there are some uh, pieces of equipment which for some reason uh, they don't like using um, and and the bedouin community itself is helping us to explain to them uh, how this is important but certainly we don't ask anybody who you are where have you come from where do you live what language do you speak at home anybody who comes to the answer and says i need your help uh, we're very willing to help them willingly and rebecca what's your community like what kinds of uh, population groups do you have we also i mean we're much again bet shemish is a much smaller town than Beersheba, but we have the same diversity of population. We don't have Bedouin, but we do have... Um, we don't Russian. have monks and nuns either, so yeah. that's all right. <laughs> right, so we do have a nearby monastery um, who have elderly uh, members and they do take equipment um, from us. We have a big Russian population, Ethiopian population, non-religious, religious, Haredim, and my volunteers more or less cover um, the range of population in Bet Shemesh. Um, uh, also, in answer to one of the questions that came up, um, we're all volunteers. 
all the branch managers are, are volunteers uh, and the, those running the lending uh, offices are all volunteers. Um, there's mm -hmm. very little paid staff. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the, as a board member, it's one of the things I'm most proud of is that um, Yatsara is, is basically run by volunteers, which is uh, in and of itself an amazing thing. Um, so, um, you know, Jonathan, as a journalist and from a broader perspective, uh, so what are some of the lessons learned uh, from uh, Israel to uh, other countries at the first phase and now? What can people learn from Yad Sara, from Israel and from Yad Sara's um, handling of the health healthcare needs of Israelis? I am not uh, clear about Yad Sarah's uh, parallels in other uh, countries, but it's it's extraordinary to have this source of equipment. I'd like to broaden it a little bit and uh, look at Israeli uh, health services that uh, really hold a lot of interest for outside uh, this country. So uh, just close close to home is. Um, the uh, the West Bank and in, in Gaza. Uh, it has been fascinating. And early, um, I was right. I asked to write some articles about the uh, sharing of expertise that um, Israeli doctors uh, shared with uh, doctors in the Gaza Strip. Um, people were terrified in March that. Uh, the strip was going to be a petri dish of disease that people were going to come in and the refugee camps are, are teeming and this was going to be a, a disaster not just for them for the Palestinians but for everybody you know in in a radius um, and I talked to a, a doctor mm -hmm. at uh, Sheba Medical Center uh, Elchanan Maron he's the head of disaster medicine um, there and he, he spends a lot of time in Africa, but he went down to uh, the Aras checkpoint uh, in the south, met with uh, Palestinian doctors. These are doctors who, who work for Hamas, and uh, you know there was enough of a concern that they they bridged uh, the issues. And uh, Hamas, w the Gaza, did not turn into the hot spot um, that it. Uh, it was. I think there are 68 cases that were there, one death. That's uh, extraordinary. Um, another thing I wanted to raise is that there's been a lot of interest in Israeli medical technology, the research um, on treatment and vaccines coming from the Persian Gulf of all places. I, you know, I think a lot of us have heard that there are uh, uh, increasing uh, contacts uh, you know, informal contacts, diplomatic concerts, attacks at a, a low level. But one thing that has sort of enabled that uh, is uh, this sort of gray area of, uh, of normalization, that it's, it's kosher, it's halal for some of the Arab countries to uh, say, okay, there is this important research uh, that's going on in Israel. There are business deals that some of the uh, medical tech startups that are actually being done in the open for the first time because of the emergency uh, nature of the time that we uh, find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, that's a very good uh, context for uh, understanding Israel's uh, contributions to uh, other countries. Um, someone, uh, Hal, has a question here that I'd like to raise uh, since we're talking a little bit about external issues. Uh, Occasionally, tourists visiting Israel run into problems such as being victims of traffic accidents, falls, etc. Is Yad Sara available to them? Yes, definitely. Rebecca, um, definitely. Like Michal said, we 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 lend out equipment to anyone. We don't ask them where they come from. Tourists can also come into Yad Sara branch and borrow equipment. They leave a deposit like everybody else, and the deposits return to them when they return the equipment. Um, on top of that, Yad Sarah also has a special service for tourists, tourists who are coming and in, in knowing in advance they're going to need help. Um, if, for example, someone elderly is coming or disabled, they can contact Yad Sarah before they arrive, and someone can meet them at the airport. We have them 
uh, vans that are specially adapted for people in wheelchairs. They can meet them at the airport with a wheelchair. They can deliver equipment to their hotel room or to wherever they're staying. Um, they also offer um, tours for um, people who are in wheelchairs, who are wheelchair bound. Um, they have volunteer tour guides and who know where places are accessible. Um, that actually is a service that maybe is less well known, but um, maybe in this forum, it, it's an important thing to know. At the moment, unfortunately, we don't have tourists and we don't know when the tourists are going to be allowed to come in, but um, right. it's an important service to know that it does exist. Yes, I, I, I think many of us are hoping that the, you know, things will improve enough for us to come and visit. Many of us uh, miss our colleagues and friends and family in Israel. Um, so what do you think Israel will be like uh, in six months from now? Can we I'll, guess? I'll take a shot at that. Um, I, uh, I'm pessimistic. Um, I think it's going to be uh, like this. I think that this is the new normal for uh, a couple of, uh, you know, at least uh, the next six months. And we've got to get used to it. And uh, you know, we're looking at college campuses in uh, the States. And, and here, my daughter is uh, supposed to go to Beresheva. She's probably going to uh, be on Zoom from uh, the northern, uh, from the Galilee. Um, and, uh, you know, we've also learned a lot. We've learned that we can, you know, occupy these boxes and, uh, and talk to each other, you know, like we're talking to you, Perry, um, uh, from here. Um, so uh, there's a lot that's good, but I don't think that uh, tourism is going to open up for uh, and travel for a long time. Yeah. And what do you see? I, I have a feeling. I have a feeling it's going to be worse before it gets better. Uh, the, the, uh, the doctors at least keep talking about the fact that when we get to the winter, when there'll be flu, together with what we have already, uh, the situation may, uh, may be much worse than it is at the moment. Um, I think we've all got into some kind of, uh, we've all changed our routine. Um, and, uh, um, and for some of it, it's, uh, it's harder than for others, I expect. Um, but, I, I, but people are saying that they don't see in the very near future that, uh, that, uh, that the situation will change uh, uh, really very much for the good, unless we do something very, very serious in, uh, with this present outbreak. Mm -hmm. And Rebecca, do you see any, uh, any optimism in the future or the same? Same, the same, unless they come up miraculously with a vaccine in the near future and it's unlikely to be that soon. Mm -hmm. I think we're all going to get used to long term walking around with masks and keeping distance and communicating via Zoom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, from your perspective and your respective branches, Yatsara is uh, ready to continue its work um, until, Definitely. until the so next Certainly, yeah. certainly. Definitely. Yeah. As I said, the, the, as I, said uh, I, I hope we'll find a solution to the uh, rehabilitation, rehabilitation center. Um, that, that really is very, uh, very worrying. Uh, um, physical health is very important, but mental health is very important as well. Uh, and the mental health of these people who are not now not allowed to come out of their homes um, is, is very, very, it's very, very worrying. But uh, apart mm -hmm. from that, with that exception, um, I hope that we'll be able to, uh, to continue to giving the services that we're giving now. Mm -hmm. And are you able to recruit, I, I know you've had some success recruiting new volunteers who are students and people who are out of work and um, from your perspective, is that a viable solution for the future? Definitely. Uh, I've just um, introduced six new volunteers in the last six weeks, two months into my branch. And in fact, I'm, people are turning to me all the time asking me there's a limit to how many new volunteers I can take in at once. Um, but there are new volunteers. They're all of them much younger. It's not. I had two or three new volunteers right at the beginning, beginning of COVID who had just started with me and they dropped out because of COVID and I haven't heard from them again. I'm assuming they're not going to come back, but the younger volunteers will stay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, we've also got, uh, got uh, new volunteers, slowly but surely. Uh, we've got a lot of students also, and very often the students, when they finish 
uh, the 60 hours or however much they're supposed to volunteer, then they, they decide that they, they're going to stay on despite that. Uh, and that, that's also very, very encouraging. Do you recruit these people of, like from the various communities or are these people who just come on their own to Yad Sara? Do you actively uh, well, Okay, so, some, of the, some, yeah, some of them that we recruited, uh, I, I sent out mails uh, to people and I, and I, and I try to recruit. Uh, the, the municipality has a, um, a recruiting center for, for volunteers and they help us a lot. They send us uh, volunteers. And there are some people who, vol who just write to Yad Sarai in Jerusalem and say, I want to volunteer. I live in Be'er Sheba, I live wherever. And, and somebody in Jerusalem sends us a name and a telephone number and we call them and we try to find, uh, we try to find a way to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to find a service which they can, uh, with which they can help us. So it's, it's all these. And of course, um, we're also, as uh, I mentioned before, a lot of the students, are, in order to get, uh, to get their grants, they also have to give uh, hours of volunteering. And, oh, and very right. often they, they, come, they come to Yad Sarah and, and give these hours. And as I say, these people very often stay on afterwards. Great, great. And, uh, you know, Jonathan, from a global perspective, I guess we started out talking, you started out talking a little bit about politics and how it, in, um, you know, how it affects uh, Yad Sarah's work and, uh, you know, the experiences that we've had during COVID. So what kind of, what do you see going on in the next six months that might uh, change the situation? Well, I, you know, I'd like to say that uh, people would uh, acknowledge and uh, absorb the, the good work that we see and hear about from Yad Sarah. And, uh, and I think it's happening in, uh, in Israel. People are um, helping each other and uh, you have uh, these uh, incidents of, uh, of Fesed across the board. Um, but politically, um, it's a mess, and uh, which is, you know, what we're used to uh, in Israel. The, uh, you, know, you have four elections in, in a year, perhaps another one uh, coming up. And, uh, but it's clear that from a policy standpoint, the government uh, is going to tighten up uh, again. There is a lot of concern about uh, restaurants opening and weddings and sw swimming pools, not so much. I hope they keep the swimming pools open. But um, the uh, just the uh, scale of, uh, of social gathering really has to contract. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I agree with you that uh, the, the overlay of uh, politics does affect uh, you know, healthcare decisions and uh, leadership is always an important uh, component of that. And uh, uh, let's see what happens in Israel and elsewhere. Uh, before we wrap up, is there anything that any of you would like to share that we didn't touch upon uh, that our viewers might be interested in hearing about? It was a fascinating discussion and I don't believe we have any additional questions. Let me just check. Aha, uh -huh. so Sari asks again if you, uh, I don't want to belabor the point about recruiting minorities uh, as volunteers. I assume you have a diverse volunteer population, right, uh, Rebecca? And, uh, right, but we talked I, about that, Michael, as well. Um, yes. My, my volunteers range from the whole, you know, the whole range of population in Bet Shemesh um, from, um, I have Russian speaking volunteers. Um, at this precise moment, I don't have someone who speaks Amharic, but I have had various students through the years that um, mm -hmm. speak Amharic. I have, you know, non-religious volunteers, religious volunteers, Haredi volunteers, French speaking, you know, English speaking volunteers, um, a whole range. Um, yes. Yeah, and I, we... I, I, I think it's very, it's very important also from a, another point of view, and that is that, that all these people go out to their communities and, and there's a lot that, that people don't know about Yad Sara. One, one of my, my great worries is uh, that somebody may be suffering unnecessarily just because he doesn't know that Yad Sara could actually help him. People yes. know about wheelchairs, but they don't know about other things. And as soon as we have all these volunteers that uh, Becca was talking about from all these different communities, they all have friends and they all have family and they all tell about what they've seen in Yad Sara. And this is, this is also very, very important for us. 
Um, I did get one question that I think uh, I presume that people know about Yatsara, but there is a question. Could you please explain a little bit about the equipment that you do uh, loan to people? We've heard about wheelchairs, but I know that there are many, many other things that uh, Yatsara loans to um, to Israelis and to travelers. Can you just outline them for our for our viewers so they have a better idea? Well, well, I think I think we we loan out almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> there are uh -huh. about, about 150 different pieces of equipment that we loan out uh, regularly to people. Um, but in addition, there's also a very large amount of very special equipment, which people probably say to themselves, Yad Sarah doesn't have that. But very often we do, because it's very often people buy a piece of special equipment and then they don't need it, usually unfortunately for unfortunate reasons, don't need it. They don't know what to do with it. So they donate it to Yad Sarah, and slowly Yad Sarah has developed, we have in Be'er Sheva also a very big store like this, a collection of all sorts of special pieces of equipment. And my message to people always is, before you go and buy something, even if you're sure that Yad Sarah doesn't have it, call Yad Sarah. And 99% of the, of, of the times that people call Yad Sarah, Yad Sarah does actually have this equipment. So this is also, so they say, what do we lend out? We lend out everything, <laughs> everything. Of course, there's some of the equipment people have to buy, things, equipment which is hygienic, people have to buy because we won't pass it on to other people. But apart from that, we lend, we lend out, uh, we lend out uh, everything, certainly. Do you want to be more specific, Rebecca? Give us some examples. Um, of the general run of the mill equipment that we lend out is anything from wheelchairs, shower chairs, uh, walkers, crutches, um, blood pressure machines, glucometers. Um, we lend out breast pumps and cribs, oxygen, um, uh, mattresses for people who are bedridden uh, to uh, uh, various special mattresses that come with a pump to a motor that keeps the mattresses pumped to avoid bed sores. Um, various equipment to help people in the bathroom, bed rails, Things like bed mm -hmm. rails or rails around um, bed rails, but also grab bars. That's the word I was looking for. Grab bars for putting up in the bathroom or bars around the toilet. Those sort of things, for example, you would buy. Um, we also have a range of equipment that we sell. A lot of physiotherapy equipment, um, and a lot of the equipment that we lend out. If people need it long term, they the the smaller items, as I call them, they can buy, you know, they can take it for a month or two to see if that's really what's good for them. But afterwards, they can then buy their own, their own one brand new. And if they need the more expensive equipment, um, say like the wheelchairs, they can pay a monthly fee to continue uh, mm -hmm. using it. Um, that's, I have two more questions here if we have time that I'd like to give, them, uh, give a moment to. One um, is during this pandemic, are you finding some areas where Yad Sarah is stretched to the limit? And are you surprised in any area where Yad Sarah is doing less now, less work now? Is there anything well, you're not? Okay, y Yad, Sarah, Yad Sarah in the beginning was, uh, was pressed to the limit with, uh, with, uh, with oxygen machines, of course. Um, and, and that was why Yad Sarah had this, uh, this tremendous, uh, uh, set up this tremendous fund um, um, of, of um, an, an enormous amount of money. I don't remember how much in the end. Uh, and we managed to import, I think even before the government managed to do it, we managed to import a, an enormous number of, of oxygen machines and, and breathing equipment. Um, and, and so uh, there wasn't anybody, in the, end, in the end, there wasn't anybody who turned to a branch in Yad Sarah and couldn't get the breathing equipment that they needed. I think this was this was something. This was a, a tremendous, tremendous achievement, and I hope that we'll manage we'll manage to keep supplying this equipment. In, in Beersheba, we have enough. I hope they have enough also uh, in, in other places. Uh, and then, in the interest of time, Rebecca, there was one more question. I think that you could answer, which was, if someone is unable to uh, pay for their uh, equipment, um, are they given free? Um, we don't give it out. It, is it free? When someone takes equipment, they leave a deposit that they then receive back in full. But sometimes if they come with certain bigger items, the deposit may be difficult for them. Um, there is an option to ask for a reduction. Um, 
I normally pass it on to, to the, the person who's above me. Um, there is actually someone whose sole job is to deal with all these requests of people who need help financially, either with their deposit or people who need the equipment long term and they find paying monthly difficult. Um, in theory, the Ministry of Health supplies um, the, these big pieces of equipment, but sometimes people prefer to come via Yad Sara um, and, and take from us if they need it, even when they need it long term. Well, I can certainly I, understand. I think, the I think the principle is, excuse me, just that one sentence, I think the principle is that somebody shouldn't go away without the equipment because they can't pay. It, certainly they should pay something, but, uh, but we're, there won't be a situation where somebody will leave without equipment just because they have uh, difficulties in paying. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been fantastic. I learned so much from you all, and I just want to give you each a moment uh, to think if there's a parting message you'd like to share with our viewers. We have like two minutes left. Anyone have any uh, additional last comments? I was once asked by a reporter if I have a dream as a, as a branch manager in Yad Sara. And I said, I, I do have a dream. My dream is that we should sit with our hands crossed and we should only give out cribs and breast pumps. I don't think that's going to happen, but that was my, that was my dream. <laughs> and, that, and that's the final word. Thank you so much, and Hatzlach Rabat to all of you. It was a pleasure meeting you all, and goodbye to everyone else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.